we have assembled ourselves together for the most solemn phase of our worship service, the Lord's Table. We now have the opportunity of recognizing the communion service as having a greater impact on our spiritual life as ever before. Communion is the test of our love for God, which is the key as to why the communion was ordained. This is so we might recognize everything that was accomplished by the integrity of God in eternity past, taking him into hypostatic union on the cross. Communion is a test of our love for God as listed in 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. This is the concept of reciprocity. Therefore, it is the ultimate in the communion service when we reach the point of occupation with Christ. The communion service is a test of concentration under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, our mentor and our teacher. This ritual is very important, for ritual without reality is meaningless. The bread represents our Lord in hypostatic union, and the integrity that came from his unique spiritual life and how it took him to the cross. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father. The bread represents the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cup represents the salvation work of Christ on the cross. Beyond that, it represents the post-salvation life, which describes the blessings that come to us, as David said, My cup runneth over. The ritual of eating and drinking is the principle of salvation by faith alone and Christ alone. So we are to relate communion to who and what our Lord Jesus Christ is and what he did on the cross. Also, there is an emphasis on the rebound technique, 1 John 1, 9. For there is a warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in which if we do not rebound, if we do not uh, maintain our filling of God the Holy Spirit before partaking the elements, you will be under liability from the Supreme Court of Heaven in three categories, warning discipline, intensive discipline, and dying discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. God has mandated that all church-age believers observe communion, the only ritual still in existence in the post-canon period of the church age. 1 Corinthians 11.24 says this, Keep on doing this in memory of me. This is a way for us to remember our Lord. It is a test of concentration always and a test for something far greater, our love for God. In preparation, therefore, for taking this examination, a few moments of silent prayer and the option of rebound if necessary, so that we might be in fellowship. Therefore, let us pray. Father, we are grateful that in eternity past you knew all about us, our successes, our failures, and you understood and knew us long before we ever existed. Therefore, we have the opportunity to learn about you and all the work of Christ on the cross and what it means to our eternal status. May God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to meditate upon these things as we are mandated to do as part of our worship service. We ask these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Pass out the bread. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's life for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant than free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim, and the light of his glory and grace. 
He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and his, and by his bruise we are all drawn together. For all we are like sheep and have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Lord made a very solemn and important statement. He said, This represents my body, which is given as a substitute for you. Our Lord also said, Take this bread and eat it. So take all of you and eat. We are greatly heavenly we are grateful, Heavenly Father, for remembering you through the cup. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will make this very real to us. We ask this in the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. It is our custom to retain the cup until all have been served. This word shall not fail you, we promise. Believe them and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. It's perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in We have not been redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from our empty manner of life, but by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord took the cup, saying, This represents the new covenant of my blood. Drink ye all of it. Everyone, please stand as we sing. Let us survey the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross. On page 13.
turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Earlier we dealt with the Jewish baptism of fire. Now we're going to deal with the Gentile baptism of fire, which will occur at the end of the tribulation. 2531. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the Gentiles will be assembled before Him, and He will separate them one from another, like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So at the end of the tribulation, those who are alive, those Gentiles who are alive, will be separated like sheep and goats. Sheep, sheep believers, goats, unbelievers. 25.33 He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom. That's the kingdom of the millennium. They're moving into the millennial reign of Christ. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This was going to happen even before the foundation of the world was created. 2535. <clears throat> for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. And I was in prison, and you visited me. Now this isn't a means of salvation, just because you've done all these things. And in fact, many of these people have never uh, fed the Lord, visited the Lord, or anything like that. We'll see what this means. Then the righteous will answer him. Righteous means imputed righteousness. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore imputed to them is righteousness. Then the righteous, the believers, will answer him. And they're confused by this as well, by their answer. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? In other words, they don't remember doing that. When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? I, they don't remember seeing that. When did you see? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I tell you the truth. Just as you did it for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. In other words, there will be people like the 144,000 Jews who will be giving the gospel all throughout the tribulation and giving doctrine, and there will be people giving the gospel and giving doctrine, and they're going to be persecuted for it, and some of them are going to be whipped half to death, and some of them are going to go naked because their clothes have been ripped off and they've been raped, and terrible things are going to happen in the tribulation. And then uh, someone who has believed in Christ is going to help one of these evangelists and one of these people uh, communicators of doctrine. And what he's saying is if you've helped one of these communicators of doctrine, if you've helped one of these evangelists in the tribulation, it's just as if you've helped me. And that is the whole point from what he's saying here. And the king will answer them, I tell you the truth, just as you did it for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. 2541. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, the unbelievers, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. 2542. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. And during the time of the tribulation, there is going to be an intensified conflict between what is called the divine dinosphere and the cosmic system. And today there's a conflict between the divine dinosphere and the cosmic system. And today families split up because one side of the family is in the divine dinosphere, the other side in the cosmic system. 
and sometimes, and I don't mean immediate families, immediate families should have sense enough to get through something like that, especially if one of them has enough doctrine to hold it together, but I'm talking about uh, extended family. Some of your extended family doesn't like doctrine. Usually a wedge is built. Not usually, it is built. And no matter how kind you are, and no matter how much impersonal love you use, they're always going to drive a, drive a wedge in their carnality. And if you think it's bad now, wait until the tribulation. When they start driving a wedge, not only will they drive a wedge, but they will try to harm you, persecute you. They may even try to murder you as a believer. It becomes so intensified that between the cosmic system and the divine diagnosphere. And so, when did you, when did, when did, uh, let's keep going. For, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. Uh, talking to the fact that there were evangelists on the earth in the tribulation and he is comparing himself to them and he says, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not receive me as a guest. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not give you whatever you needed? Then he will answer them, I tell you the truth, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. For one of the least of these will be mainly for the 144,000 evangelistic Jews who will be going all through Israel evangelizing. And because they're evangelizing and giving the gospel of Christ, they're going to come under heavy attack from others something that we will never see and thank God we'll never see anything like that because some of us are too spineless to even know what it would be all about. Because what's going to happen is these 144,000 are going to go out and they're going to have to give the gospel and every time they give the gospel it's going to offend someone. And some people would rather watch TV than offend someone. Somebody would rather uh, do something else than uh, maybe hurt somebody's feelings. Well, if uh, the gospel hurts somebody's feelings, it's better that they have hurt feelings for five minutes than to burn in hell for eternity. That's why our Lord is so tough. That's why doctrine is so tough. It's better to get chewed out. If you're, if you're out of line, it's better to get chewed out and to deal with it and to move on than to wallow around in your self-pity. And these people, will, these people will not do that. They will go out and they will give the gospel. And they'll be beaten for it. Their clothes will be ripped off. They will, re they will be denied food and water. And they're going to go out and they're going to give the gospel and be beaten for it. All sorts of terrible things are going to happen to them. And yet they're going to keep going. Yet today it's hard enough to get anybody to witness on a beautiful Anderson day like this. But that's okay because most people in Anderson on a beautiful day like this are so happy that they're just inviting Christ everywhere. Have fun. And that, I'm sorry, that stuff just burns me up. Some of you don't understand it yet. One day, once you learn enough, I bet you'll really click into it. And you'll really say, you know what? You're not saved by inviting Christ into your heart. So why save it? Or you know what? You aren't saved by a one-shot decision. And right now, you might be struggling and say, well, maybe you could be saved by that. But... Uh, no, you can't. Not possible. It's just you might as well uh, join the uh, Muslims. Invite Christ into your heart or join the Muslims. You're still unsaved. Invite Christ into your heart or join Judaism. Still unsaved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
believe. There's only one name under heaven by which man can be saved, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ, and there's only way, faith alone in Christ alone. It really saddens me to see what's going on today. And what's going to happen during this time in the uh, tribulation, there's going to be a lot of ecumenical religion. And they're going to say, let's just have brotherhood. Let's just have brotherhood and get together and have a, a one world deal going on. And it's going to sound great and there's going to be a huge hippie movement. And there'll probably be a bigger Woodstock than you've ever seen before out in the meadows somewhere of some a decadent European nation. And then, after all of that, uh, they will start beating Christians because they will say Christians are the problem. They go around saying we must believe in Christ and go to hell. That's not brotherly love. They offend me by telling me I'm going to hell. And so they, be, they become persecuted, severely persecuted. Then he will answer them, I tell you the truth, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these 144,000, you did not do it for me. And these will depart into eternal punishment. But the righteous, those who have believed in Jesus Christ, notice it doesn't say, but the self-righteous, righteous. righteous. In, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. We believe in the Lord and it's credited to our account for righteousness. But the righteous into eternal life. That's us, those of us who have believed in Christ. Now, as we move on, now as we move on, we're going to get into something. Uh, well, interesting enough, we're going to have to talk about Peter. <laughs> Peter's about to make a big mistake, but it's not really that big a deal. Peter's big mistake is no bigger than somebody telling somebody invite Christ into your heart about on that level, but Peter knows better, and uh, he's really going to have, he's going to have an emotional, he, he, I, 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 would, I would surmise, I don't know for sure, I would surmise this man had a nervous breakdown shortly after all this that's about to happen. He didn't want it, first of all, he didn't want Jesus Christ to die, they were good buddies, see, and he thought of Jesus Christ being his biggest buddy. And all of that, all this is going to hit him hard. So what we have now coming up uh, is the fact that Peter will betray or deny, deny, betray. He will deny Christ three times. That's coming up in the following verses. Now we need to get a, a little bit of background before we get into the fact that he denied Christ. If you ever witnessed with some people, as I have, many years ago when I was a teenager, I witnessed to people, and they would say, well, what if I deny Christ after I believe in him? Does that mean that I'm still saved? And i say, yes, that means you're saved. And they would say, but I've denied him. And then I'd have to say, well, Peter denied him three times, and he's the gatekeeper as it is. He's in heaven. So what we must do is bring out some very logical principles of uh, eternal security. Things we've studied before in the essential series, but it won't be as detailed, and I'll just uh, name it off to you. There are ten of them. There are ten approaches as to why we have eternal security and why nothing can take away our salvation after we believe in Christ. So this is ten points on the doctrine of eternal security or the biblical approach to eternal security. Now we're about to go into a narrative and eternal security is definitely going to be a part of this narrative. So here we go. Point one, there's the logical approach to eternal security. Logical approach. If God did the most for us when we were his enemy, and he did, if God did the most for us when we were his enemies, how much more will he do for us now? Romans chapter 5 makes it clear that uh, 
he will do much more. So when we were enemies and we believe in Christ, we're no longer enemies. We are now at peace with God under reconciliation. How much more will he give us now? And why in the world would a God who wants us to be saved uh, simply uh, take away our salvation because of some stupid thing we do on the earth? That's stupid. It's like saying, uh, I'll disown my daughter if she gets a tongue ring. You might be mad, but she's still your daughter. And that's all, and that's really, but that's a whole different approach. We'll get to that. But the logical approach says, if God did the most for us when we were his enemies, how much more will he do for us now? All of that comes out of Romans 5. Then we have the argument of positional truth. We are in union with Christ. We are in union with Christ. That's found in Romans 8, 38 through 39. What does Romans 8, 38 and 39 say? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature uh, nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, 38, and 39. And remember, what do we have here? Principalities and powers. Who are they? Demons. Satan. Satan would love no more than to de disrupt our eternal security. If Satan can't do it, the greatest genius in the world the greatest angel, super genius in the world, how in the world can we destroy our eternal salvation? We cannot, no matter what types of stupid sins we commit. Then we always get the idiots that run around. You telling me I can go around and just slaughter a whole bunch of people and I'm still going to go to heaven? Yes, you are. Jesus Christ died on the cross for any sin you will commit. Or he has. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved. You're in union with Christ. And you might be the worst toad on the face of the earth. But it doesn't matter how many times you sin. You're saved. It doesn't matter if you renounce Christ. You're still saved. That comes out of 2 Timothy, by the way. So positional truth. We are in union with Christ. What did we do to get in union with Christ? Nothing. Yes, we believe, but God the Holy Spirit did it. We did nothing. Belief is not... We could believe 2 plus 2 is 4, but that belief is nothing. We did nothing. God the Holy Spirit did all the work in regeneration. We did nothing. Oh, we believed in Christ. As a result, God the Holy Spirit does all the work. That's what we must understand. And that's what non-meritorious means. I've had people always come up to me before. Well, what do you mean you did it's nothing? You've got to believe. You've got to believe. Why can't you just believe in this, believe in that? Because uh, faith is the only thing that the, is required of Scripture, and it's the only thing that God the Holy Spirit makes effective for salvation, and it's God the Holy Spirit doing the work, and it's God the Holy Spirit putting us in union with Christ. All of these things occur mechanically, and we have nothing to do with it except faith. So in a roundabout way, yes, when you believe in Christ, you'll be put into union with Christ. That's the grace of God. There's no credit on your part. Romans uh, 8. Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cannot be separated from the love of God. We are in His hands. That's the third point. 
God's hands. Point three, God's hands. The believer is in the hand of God, and God does not let go. This is found in Psalm 37, 24. Though he fall, that be us. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down. He will hold his hand. And John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. You can't be plucked out of the hand of God once you believe in Jesus Christ. You're there. You can't even squirm out of the hand of God. You know how powerful God is, or you should. And to think that you can sin and pop out of His hand, well, you're full of yourself. That's exactly what that means. And then we have the experiential approach, number four. The experiential approach comes straight from 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. That could not be any clearer. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Why cannot he deny himself? That is because we are in union with him. And if we're in union with him, uh, he cannot deny himself. Now, I'm aware there's a verse right above that that says, If we deny him, he will deny us. This is dealing with eternal rewards. If you deny Christ, he will deny us eternal rewards. Has nothing to do. It doesn't say anything about losing your salvation at all. If you deny him, he will deny us. And then you say, well, we're not going to heaven if you deny him. But then just follow up with this verse. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. There are people in my family who have at one time believed in Christ, gotten on doctrine, and then went way off the deep end and studied Buddha and all kinds of other crazy people. And uh, guess what? They became faithless, but they're going to be in heaven and I'm going to see them one day. Why? Grace! That's why. Grace is a phenomenal thing. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Then, of course, we have the family approach. Galatians 3.16 talks about how we're in the family of God. We are born again into the family of God, and you are always in the family of God. And just the same as you're born into a human family, you're always in that human family. Now, of course, you could get a little weird and say, what about adoption? What about this? What about that? Well, uh, we uh, forget about that. Just think about it in the terms of you're in a family. You have a mother and father. Even if you're adopted, you have a mother and father biological. And you're still genetically part of that family. And, uh, and while you might be raised by someone else, you're genetically part of the family that adopted you. Uh, or genetically part of that family that left you to be adopted. You are still a part of their genetics, still part of their DNA, and still considered part of the family. So there's the family approach. When we believe in Christ, we're put in union, and therefore we're in union with Christ as a family. Now this family approach is really... Uh, because of the degeneracy of our country, it becomes uh, a, l- a little more uh, difficult to explain the family approach. It used to be yeah, mother, father, children. They're in a family. They're always in a family. you got a bad kid and a good kid. Maybe a good sister, a bad boy. Maybe a, a, a bad a sister and a good boy. Either way, they're both family. And they're all part of your family. There's no way around it. Then we have the inheritance approach of 1 Peter 1, 4, and 5. And I won't go over that, but uh, we have an inheritance, and it's found in 1 Peter 1, 4, and 5. And when you're part of a family, usually you receive an inheritance, 
even if you're poor, you receive an inheritance, even if it is the uh, outhouse. If I, if I inherit anything from my grandparents-in-law, I want their house. That's a joke. I don't want it. I just think it's pretty neat looking. Oh, and by way of announcement, next week's schedule's up in the air. I may be up in the air going to Houston. So, I'll let you know tomorrow, probably. I'll let you know tomorrow at class. Okay, so the inheritance approach, then the sovereignty approach. He is not willing that anyone should perish, but should come to eternal life. That's the sovereignty approach. And this is actually the will of God the Father. He is not willing that anyone should perish, but should come to eternal life. So it is his will and his work. That's also found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. God the Father wants all of us to come to eternal life. He wants all unbelievers to come to eternal life. And if you're a believer and you've come to eternal life, why in the world would he take it away from you when he wants you to have it in the first place? That's the logic to it. Very logical and very sane. And, uh, but a lot of people don't like to be confused with the facts. All right. So now we go to the Greek tense approach. And that's the perfect tense of Ephesians 2 a. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And actually it goes this way. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith in the past with results that go on forever. And it's all part of the Greek there. And the English leaves some of that out. But even in the English, it makes it very clear. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, yet adding in that Greek perfect tense just adds more to it to say, hey, you're eternally secure. Nothing you can do about it. Then there's the body approach of 1 Corinthians 12:21. And that is Jesus Christ is the head. We're all members of the body. Some of us might be brother, hand, sister, foot, etc. One of you might be pinky toe. If the pinky toe gets a cramp, does Jesus Christ cut it off? No. Pinky toe having a cramp, pinky toe is out of fellowship. Jesus Christ is not going to cut it off. You're still part of the body, the body approach, and Jesus Christ is not going to cut up his body. You're in his body, and he's not going to cut it up and say, Oh, this person's a bad person. Off goes this finger. And that's the body approach. We are the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. And that's where it says, The head cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. And since we're the body of Christ, uh, God needs us. Well, he'll keep us saved, and we need God, but he'll keep us saved eternally as part of his body. And that's simple enough, because uh, when we all get to heaven, we know that we are going to see Jesus Christ with a full body. And you're not going to see Jesus Christ with no arm and then say, Oh, Joe and Joe, uh, Joe Dirt messed up. Jesus cut off his arm, Joe Dirt messed up. No. They'll say, uh, it'll still be there. If Joe Dirt messed up, so what? Body's intact. You're all part of the body. Once you believe in Christ, no matter who and what you are, it all depends on who and what Christ is. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.